who is going to tell us a little bit uh, more about IoT success, how developers are key to IoT success. Let me give the uh, audience a little bit of background about you so that uh, I'll embarrass you because you're too modest, you wouldn't yeah. say. I'll um, say it again. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> stay with us. Magnus is a Swedish entrepreneur and quite honestly has the largest number of uh, involvements with uh, businesses that I've ever come across. You have f uh, many, many hats that you, uh, that you wear and many activities. He's one of the busiest men I know. Um, he is sales director at the Connected Car uh, SaaS company Springworks, uh, the owner of the consulting firm WBird. He's co-founder and evangelist at the hardware hub Things, and Magnus serves at the boards of Things, Evo Things, Clue, April Systems, Posio, Mobile Institute, Stockholm, and Calazzo. Uh, his focus is on IoT M2M, and he also founded, as if all of that wasn't enough, the Swedish M2M Service Enablers Alliance, SMSE. Um, he did that in 2012, and today it has, and I, this was the last figure that I have, 55 members and 17... 57. 57. I, I knew I'd be out of date. 57 members and 17 partners. You're in good hands. Ladies and thank gentlemen, you. Magnus Melander. Thank you, and thank you for staying for a couple of... <laughs> for a couple of minutes more. I was thinking, what can I talk about after this fantastic uh, agenda today that you haven't heard about? So I was thinking developers. We owe developers a lot. And, and I think in IoT, developers are actually key. Somebody will have to connect the physical things. Otherwise, we have no big data or no systems or no nothing. And working with like hardware, for instance, is very complicated. It's always been, and it's going to remain very difficult. So I'll, I'll talk about developers, but first, let me see now. First, I'll just give you a little bit of my own view of IoT, so you understand where I'm coming from. I think IoT is nothing. It's not a market, it's not an industry, it's really nothing. It's just an evolution of internet. So what we can learn from is when the internet happened, we can learn a lot from that, but beyond that, I don't think there's a lot of other things we can learn from. It will be the same thing again. It starts with connectivity. You remember the 50 billion devices? That was the connectivity area of IoT. Then we talk about operational values when people start to save money. And that's kind of where we are right now. You, can, you, you started to say, ooh, internet. We can, put our, you know, we can put our price lists on the web. We don't have to print them. And that's the kind of stage we are in today with IoT. And then comes the strategic values that are magnificent. You know, that's all about building new brands, moving horizontally into other industries, changing business models, and so forth. I would argue this happens the same way as last time, but probably 10 or 50 or 100 times faster. So we are very rapidly coming close to the strategic value phase, let's call it. Now, this is the reason why, I think. There are three primary deliverables from IoT. One is sustainability, which is on everybody's agenda today. Countries, rich countries, poor countries, companies, people. Sustainability is really key to us. The other one is safety and security. Same thing, it's on everybody's agenda today. And finally, efficiency. You know, how can we maintain our healthcare services with an aging population? All those kind of issues we all share. And none of those are possible to actually do something about for real unless we start to understand how to connect things to the internet. So this is, a, for, to me, a customer-driven market or customer-driven development. This is not coming from standards or it's not coming from one company putting together a platform or something like that. This comes from people who have a problem that we can help them solve with technology. An IoT solution is incredibly complicated. You know, that's why we, we love to talk about you know, Fitbits and those kind of very simple things. But a real IoT solution is very complicated. And I'll show you in a moment how complicated it is. Uh, it's first at the moment where information ends up in a process or in a decision-making uh, situation that we actually deliver value. Everything up until that point is just cost and waste and effort. It's really hard to visualize the results when you start. This is so difficult. This is why it's so complicated to go to your boss and say, if we connect all those garbage cans, it will be fantastically successful in the future. It's really hard to sell that idea. 
And that's why prototyping and trials is so important. And nobody should just stay on PowerPoint and Excel. There's no way you can develop anything on IT from that. You have to start, and try, and prototype. You have to have an agile approach, and you really have to remember the mobile, because the mobile, this is a mobile-centric development, not really a computer-centric development. I have some kind of a flu here, so I have to drink. This is a very nice picture pulled together by Beecham many years ago, just to show how incredibly complicated life is. This is all the different segments of businesses and broken down into different types. And we're going to be in the end, you know, talking IoT, we are in the far end of all of those. That's why it's so really complicated and so many fragmentations will appear. It's not one big thing. It's not two companies who are going to solve all of this. We have to start in the end of all of those. A baker in Milan, he knows he has to figure out a way to bake better bread or cheaper bread or faster bread or something like that. This is why it's so complicated. It's at least three industries involved. It starts with what I call collect information or collect data. That includes connectivity, operators, sensors, gateways. Or, so it's actually many industries. But to simplify life, collect data is, is the first part of this issue. The second part of the issue is to take the data and put it somewhere where it can, can be worked with. And we have done this for ages. This is IT. This is a completely different industry. This is where we talk about, you know, big data. People love the word big data. We have done that for so many years, you know. It's nothing really new. This is where people get really interested, because this is where a lot of money can be made. This is where we ended up in the, in the managed data kind of phase of IoT. This is when Microsoft and Oracle and SAP, all those kind of people started to react. The problem here is that we still have not delivered anything to anyone. There's no value created still. We have to distribute some kind of information to the right place at the right time in the right way to get some value out of this. And that's what I call distribute. This is all about prototyping. You have to show people what, about, what happens if you get something like this on your phone? Or what happens if those lamps are blinking like this? Or what happens if, you know, what happens, what happens? Nobody knows. You cannot figure that one out yourself. You have to prototype. This is where all the app developers come into play. This is where displays and, and digital signage, all those kind of things comes to play. This is where business systems come to play. Because when, when an SAP system in a, in a logistic company somewhere says, parcel delivered, that's the value. You know, that's when the value actually appears from a lot of different things you have done to trace and track and so forth. And, and also it comes from decision systems. You know, to, to, write, to make the right decisions for your business. That's actually when the value comes to play. First statement, hardware is back. Somebody will have to fix the T in IoT. It's really difficult. It, you know, if you talk to investors, I was an investor myself before, there are three things they don't like. Hardware, infrastructure, and tools. They are very different to get funding for. Well, we need somebody to fund hardware investment. So the, the good news is that prototyping hardware is now very simple. We have got a lot of new tools from people like Bosch and Texas Instruments and Arduinos and so forth. So we can quite easily start to prototype and, and see what happens with different types of hardware. We, we have been able to, you know, all, all solutions obviously include software. But we have now with, with this type of hardware, we have made it much easier that with an agile approach to synchronize development of software and hardware in the company. This has been a huge problem for many years, that you know, the hardware guys already they have a mistake, and that's a, a year, you know, it, it adds another year to the development, and all the software guys are ready and waiting for something to ship. So I think with this more agile approach that is enabled by new types of hardware and software for prototyping, we can much more kind of synchronize development of hardware. Now, have you heard about the makers movement? That's something very interesting. Now, when it's soon is summer, you should read a couple of books about the makers movement. It's all about the accessibility of making hardware that has happened. It's become cheaper, easier, and it has actually grown a lot of kind of hobbyist uh, groups in the world, it started in the US, to start to do their own hardware. They teach themselves, 
they, they buy some and share some equipment, some laser cutters, some 3D printers and so forth. It's a very interesting topic. And this one will actually fuel IoT. Read my lips. Remember where you heard it first. This will fuel IoT. I have these things, this hardware hub in Stockholm. We have 30 companies in wearables, IoT automation, sensors, and 3D scanning and printing. Uh, in the basement, we have the biggest makers organization in Stockholm. They have 400 hobbyists. They have fantastic equipment. My companies, they're using them all the time because they're very clever at different things. Crowdfunding, we all heard about crowdfunding. That is primarily to help hardware companies to get funded. Since the investors don't, well, this is a very good tool for them. And finally, the hardware issues marry the large companies and the small. They share exactly the same issues. So this is why I think we, we have 30 startups, but we also have a couple of big export industries like ABB and Asa Bloy and Husqvarna and so forth, working on the same issues. I think this is very key to IoT moving forward. Service enabled, I was so happy with Arthur DeLittle this morning because we call our alliance here, we call that service enablers, uh, in, in, what we do. Service enablers are a fantastic shortcut to get already knowledge, things that people have learned from a specific industry or a specific application. They have developed some kind of a platform or so, which is targeting something specifically, like logistics or, or industries or so forth. So when you start to develop your own or look into developing your own applications in any company, if you turn to a service enabler, they will have a two or three years of experience that you can gain from them. So, why should we focus on developers in IoT? Well, you remember this picture again. So, there are so many instances where developers touch the process. And you know, a good developer and a bad developer, that makes a complete difference. If you, have, if you have a really lousy security implementation, or you have a terrible kind of hardware implementation, or battery life is sucks on your product, or whatever, you will have a very bad solution. So, developers, they touch this process everywhere. It starts with the actual things. I've highlighted a couple of them now. It starts with the things. It's very easy for a large company to say that, yeah, we're going to connect all our lawn movers. Easy. Which, which network are we going to use? You know, and then they pick something and they so this, well, who will actually connect them? And how should that work? Who in our company can do that? It's very difficult to do. So hardware focused or hardware skilled developers is really key to all of this. Energy consumption for everything that moves or anything that has to be stuck somewhere, a sensor that has to be there for 10 years or 20 years, is really crucial. You have a lot of developers, they have to be really good at managing energy consumption in the entire solution. Footprint, you know, you, you, the, the embedded processors, they are normally very small. All developers are used to develop, you know, on, on endless amount of memories and, and bandwidth. Here we talk about tiny, tiny storages, tiny, tiny bandwidth in the whole low power WAN area that we discussed earlier. It's all about being very, very tiny in terms of footprint. And security wise, all the security measures we use today require a big footprint. So if you're going to put something in this one, you know, if this is connected, you're going to put some HTTPS or something like that. You know, it doesn't fit. You need Assembler programmers, the good old assembler programmers who can shrink down your software to very, very minimal and efficient software. It goes on like this. Speed, security is obviously immensely important. You have to understand the whole issues of cloud services, of course, back and forth. Now, privacy, that I think is the biggest challenge for IoT. And why, why that? Well, security, we have learned to live with, you know. We have learned, unfortunately, to accept things go wrong. We apologize. Yeah, 200 million or whatever credentials were stolen. It will never happen again. We found this problem. We fired this guy. You know, half a year or a year later, we've forgotten that. You know, nobody remembered that Sony lost, I don't think, about 2 million credentials of their customers a couple of years ago. It's even worse. We hardly remember the, the, the terror attack in Paris. It's half a year ago, but we, we kind of have already, we are on our way to forget that. So security is a very big issue, but it can always be sorted out afterwards. You, you, you know, you, there's a hole somewhere and you, you just plug the hole. 
privacy is something completely different. When your data is gone, it's gone. It's going to be gone forever. There's no way you can get it back. And if, if requirements on privacy will increase, which I'm sure they will, I'm absolutely sure it will, then you will have to have an architecture of whatever solution you have which can cope with that. And that sounds easy, but it's not, because nobody knows when the requirements will change or how. Some will come from, from governments and policies, obviously. That's quite easy, because they give you notice. Some will come from consumers. You know, over a weekend, there can be a riot on Facebook because some people felt they were really, you know, badly managed. And, you know, people say, we stop by this kind of stuff. You might end up just losing your entire service. And you will have to rebuild the whole service from scratch to meet the privacy requirements if you don't have a, a good architecture. I also think it requires a trusted partner somewhere in your service to deal with the data and to cater for the data for your consumers or for your users. We know about open data analysis, rapid prototyping I talked about. Industry experience is really important. There's nothing like an IoT solution like that. It depends completely what you're going to use it for. Weather conditions, what kind of people will use it. You know, th there's all kind of reasons why you have to have industry expertise. And this is why it's so important to work with the service enablers. Because they not only have the technical skills, they also have the experience from a specific industry. They might not solve all your problems, but it's a very good start to work with them. Integration is incredibly important, and that's probably still the biggest single business in IoT, to take all the bits and pieces and the modules and the networks and the computer and just integrate it into a solution. This will hopefully be made easier as standards, you know, whether they are formal standards or, or, or informal, doesn't matter, but, you know, internet has never really been standardized in a sense, but we have a lot of common ways of developing applications of the internet. That kind of stuff will happen in IoT as well. One thing which is really interesting when you do IoT services, and actually services on the internet in general, is that the whole notion of versions is gone. Successful companies today, they don't talk about versions. They have a fantastic dynamic release management approach, which makes their product improve and improve and improve without you even knowing it. They don't say now it's a new version of something. It just happens. You know from your iPhones and stuff, it, it, all of a sudden they do things that you they haven't talked about, you know. Do you want to get this phone number from an email I found? Uh, you know, that's what I mean with release management. It's very important. Very few developers know how to do that. You have, uh, I don't know what APS stands for actually. UX, obviously, none of those services will work unless you have very, very good interfaces and, and, and behavior towards the users. And, you know, things like stickability, you know, things have to really stick to people, otherwise they forget it. So this is a huge, complicated uh, number of things that our developers have to, work, to solve for us. And the whole idea that we use from, you know, people would believe that now we come from IT and we know how to do things. Now, IT have outsourced, uh, you know, development to, to around the world where it's cheapest. And IT budgets typically have come down in the decision tree in the company and so forth. The problem is that most of those issues you cannot just outsource somewhere. It's not something you just buy. It's not something you just, you know, you try to squeeze prices on. This is vital for your solution to be successful. So I think we owe a lot to the developers. I think there will be a lot, and we see this in Stockholm right now, a lot of the companies actually bring home all the developers. They sit in a single room, they work together, they have vacations the same days, you know, back to, back to the old basics, how we did things in the past. Because synchronizing development is so important and, and being kind of very close and making sure everything sticks and, and fits very nicely together is so important. I worked for Apple quite many years, and Jobs once said, if we have more than 10 developers on anything, they're the wrong developers. So maybe that's what we're going to learn again. <laughs> so I have my alliance, just to, to tell you a little bit, I have my alliance of Swedish IoT startups, or service enablers. We are now 57. Uh, they are all focusing on different things. They are that we do two things together. We try to help each other to combine 
solutions. So if a customer have a need, one guy talks to the other and say we can do this together and so forth. So that's the first kind of benefit of being there. But secondly, we try to position Sweden as a good place to look for skills and knowledge in this field. So that's why I'm out like this. To, to, I'm talking for all of those guys to help them. And we also have a couple of partners. We have 18 partners now who actually some of them are international now, so we, that's the, the goal, that we're going to have people like Telefonica who understand that this is a very good place to look for solutions and stuff. Conclusions. This is happening now, we don't have to tell you that again, but you all know that. The internet of everything, the internet of not only people and businesses, but also things, is happening right now. I always say the only difference, major difference, between when internet came and when IoT comes or the new uh, internet, is that ignorance is no acceptable excuse. Last time, people would still stick to the job even if they missed the whole thing. Because how could they know, you know? How could I know in my bookstore company that, you know, somebody could sell books over the internet? I'm sure that this time people will not keep the jobs. Start now and put away all the PowerPoints and everything. Start practice, start do things. There are actually tools today where you can rapidly, in a couple of hours, provide a prototype on your mobile phone for connecting a couple of things using JavaScript, which is the most common. You can find probably hundreds of JavaScript programmers in your company, because that's what people mainly do today. Only JavaScript skill is enough to start to prototype. To do the ultimate solution, you probably need something else. But there is, it's very easy to get going today. Data is absolutely by far the most important thing to keep an eye on. You have to decide up front what you're going to do with the data, how do we going to deal with the privacy issues, how, how, uh, uh, how, what data should we give away and what shouldn't we give away, and those kind of issues. That's going to be very important. And remember, no hardware, no data. We have to make sure we have people who can connect the things, otherwise we will have no data. All those 50 billion devices, I don't know where they're going to come from, because somebody will have to, every single one have to be designed and, and produced and so forth. Specialized service enablers, perfect way to get going. They save two or three years for you, probably. And then finally, developers makes the difference. A bad developer kills you. A good developer might help you to be the stars. That's it. Last presentation, quick. 